Rebecca asked me to cover fall uh, honeybee management and, and what we do in the fall to get ready to overwinter the bees. So uh, let me just say a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a longtime beekeeper. Uh, up there, I said I've been keeping bees for 45 years, but it's really been a little bit longer than 45 years. So, uh, and uh, I've kept bees in a lot of different places, uh, you know, California, Louisiana, uh, Kentucky for uh, 30 years, uh, e even overseas a little bit. So, um, you know, you, the funny thing is, I don't like honey that much, uh, but I do, I do like keeping bees. I think bees are really cool animals, and they're just fun, I, I, and I really like them when they're productive. So uh, I guess we all have our own reasons for doing what we do. So uh, what, one of the really cool things I did is I worked in North Africa uh, for a few years, and I was in the Peace Corps, and I was a Peace Corps beekeeper. And uh, I, as you can see in that picture in the upper uh, right there, uh, there's a, a beehive there, but what's really interesting is what's behind it. And there's probably 50 beehives behind that. That's how they would traditionally keep their bees. They were putting these in long banks uh, and cover them with straw for the heat there. Uh, but, uh, that was part of my job was to help them uh, modernize their, their uh, beekeeping industry. So on this next slide, you can see those, those, uh, those long tubes. They're, they're about 12 inches in diameter and about a yard long. And they'd put their bees in there and they'd cap the ends with, a, uh, with some uh, animal dung, sort of a door made of animal dung, and, and that's how they've been keeping bees for over 2,000 years. Uh, and the varroa mite, the same pest that we have now, back then was just wiping out their bees, and so I was showing them how to move their bees into modern hives and treat for varroa mite. Um, and it was really interesting seeing how they were doing things. Uh, they made some wonderful honey there. They had orange and thyme, rosemary, eucalyptus, and heather honey. And honey was very expensive back then. It was uh, almost $25 a quart. And this was back in early, uh, the early 80s. And uh, uh, very expensive. And so I showed them how to move bees from uh, uh, their traditional hives into to modern frames and get them established into the modern hives and then how to control for varroa mite. And so uh, the interesting thing is I learned almost as much as they learned uh, just do, doing all this. So it, it was pretty interesting. Uh, after I got out of the Peace Corps, I started uh, my, my own apiary and uh, for a couple of years there and I I went from three beehives up to 117 beehives, and I was doing queen rearing for uh, another commercial beekeeper and helping an, another commercial beekeeper move his thousand hives around the country. So I spent quite a bit of time just working as a beekeeper, and it was it was a lot of fun. I uh, learned learned a lot. Um, but I guess the reason why I'm telling you this is I, I'm a bee hobbyist. Uh, I'm not trained you know at the university as a bee specialist i am an extension specialist but i work with controlling insects on vegetables and fruit and forages and tobacco uh, really the beekeeping has just been a very long time hobby for me so i'm talking to you as a hobbyist tonight and it's going to give you my perspectives on uh, how to prepare your bees for winter so fall honey bee management so, you know, when it comes to uh, honeybees, uh, it really depends if you're a hobbyist or a commercial beekeeper. This was a, a, uh, a survey that was done and they asked uh, hobbyists uh, what impacted overwintering success of their bees. And they indicated, you know, weak colonies, starvation, you know, queens that fail on them, and the, the varroa mite. 
but then you know you, you go to commercial beekeepers and some of the things are the same but some of the things are different what really impacted overwintering success, success with the commercial beekeepers was queen failure again and i I completely agree with queen failure. I've had a number of queens that fail during the summer as well as fail during the winter. Varroa mites, and I think the varroa mite is our number one problem with bees. Uh, and it's not only the varroa mite itself, but it's, it's transmitting over a dozen viruses that can wipe out bees as well. So it, it just does a lot of, lot of damage. Uh, pesticides. Uh, it's interesting that hobbyists don't mention pesticides, but commercial beekeepers do. One reason is that uh, hobbyists tend to have bees around their home and they're not using a lot of pesticides. A lot of commercial beekeepers may have their bees in commercial agricultural fields where they're more likely to get exposed to pesticides. And then uh, uh, commercial beekeepers also did note uh, colony collapse disorder. So the, those are some, some of the reasons. So it's a little bit different with hobbyists and, and commercial beekeepers for that, that four reasons that impact overwintering success for hobbyists. I completely agree with all those. Weak colonies, starvation, which is poor management, queen failure, which the beekeeper doesn't have a lot of control over, and then varroa mite but the beekeeper does have control over varroa mite management. So some of the things I wanted to cover tonight uh, in terms of fall, this is what I think about when it comes to fall colony management. I think about colony strength. You know, you want to take your losses in the fall. You don't want to take your losses in the spring. So uh, colony health and really emphasizing varroa mite management. That's, that's so important. Uh, winter food reserves, making sure that you have uh, enough food for the bees to winter, uh, downsizing the space, um, rodent control, or I should just say animal control when, when it comes to bees, and then maintaining equipment. So uh, Sam, John, do you have other things that you might think need to be added to this list? No, I don't. Okay. Well, let, let me just go ahead and get started with this. So um, first thing is, is colony strength. And uh, larger colonies in the fall have been shown to survive better and produce more spring honey than small colonies. So that, that's a fact. Uh, this one paper that, that I looked up, they said, uh, when the, the weight of the colony is more than 50 pounds, there is 90% survival. But when the weight of the colony is less than 27 pounds, I mean, sorry, it's less than 40 pounds, the survival goes down to 27%. And how they measured the weight of the colony was everything except for the woodenware. So that includes honey that's stored there as well as the bees. So um, stronger colonies do do better. And so what they're talking about, just doing some calculations, that's about 15 frames covered with bees in the fall. So that's really what you want to target as a good, strong colony for the winter uh, in terms of the number of bees. And so in order to get your bees up to that point, you need to have a good, strong queen that can lay eggs you need to maintain brood rearing throughout the spring, summer, and fall. You want your bees to keep making new bees during the year. So you want to keep your bees in nutrient-rich locations where there's lots of flowers, flowers that have the pollen and nectar form. If you don't have that, uh, you need to give them supplemental food. And I was just talking to Sam earlier that here in Lexington, my experience has shown me that you know, come uh, uh, August and early September, there's not a lot of food for the bees here. And so I have to feed my bees during the summer. Usually in July, I'll rob the honey uh, just at the end of the, the white clover bloom. And then in uh, August, I will start feeding the bees. And that's particularly important for new hives 
that still need to dry out comb in their supers and, and in their brood boxes. If, you know, I, when I get into September, if I have wheat colonies that just are not gonna be able to build up to that level, I think about combining those with some medium-sized colonies to get their numbers up. Again, I'd like to, as I said before, take my losses in the fall rather than take my losses in the spring. To just combine those bees. The other thing that, that I, and this is really important, is colony health. You need to keep your bees uh, healthy. And I think the, the number one uh, public enemy of honeybees is the varroa mite. And so uh, sample your bees. Um, they have various different methods, alcohol, powdered sugar. You know, uh, you take about a half cup of bees, you pour it into a container that's about 300 bees. And then you can use uh, various things, alcohol, soap, powdered sugar and you, you shake it around and you, you pour it through a filter and you see how many varroa mites come, come out. The, the threshold is two to three mites per 100 bees. And if you have two or three or more, you need to treat your bees. Again, it's not only that they reduce the survival of the, of the larvae, they shorten the life of the adult, they can cause deformed wings, they're transmitting over a dozen viruses that can affect the brood, the workers. There's some viruses that, that affect the queen and it's, it's all uh, carried by this varroa mite. So we need to keep the varroa mite under control. Uh, there is a website, uh, it's called the Honey Bee Coalition. Uh, it's uh, honeybeecoalition.com. Uh, you get on there and there's a tool for uh, helping you manage varroa mite. It will help you uh, show you how to sample. They have videos on sampling. Uh, if you're over that two or three mites, since there's so many different products now to control for uh, varroa mites, they'll help you select the best product uh, to control that mite. And this next slide shows you just a, a couple of screen captures from their website. But you know what product you use to control varroa mites depends upon whether or not you have brood uh, bee larvae in the colony. Some of the products will kill the bee larvae. Uh, the time of year, whether it's spring, uh, you know, honey flow after the honey flow, or getting ready for the fall, those are all different times of the year, and you might use different products. Whether or not you have supers on the bees. The temperature, you know, so some of these products at higher temperature can be, uh, uh, they can injure the adult bees. You can kill the bees or you can run the bees off out of the colony. And then, you know, some bee beekeepers would rather be organic and some uh, accept synthetic products. So, so there's a lot of different variables that go into what products you select. And so this website has a tool where they'll ask you a bunch of questions and based on how that you answer those questions, they'll tell you what your options are for treating varroa mite. And so I just went through it twice here and I show you the results uh, based on how I answered the questions. And you can see the different products that, they, that are available there. The ones in yellow are organic. The ones in red are synthetic products. And again, these are used at different types of times of the year and under different, uh, situations, but the key is going to that Honey Bee Coalition website, and they will really walk you through that and, and help you make a good decision with uh, in terms of varroa mite control. But controlling varroa mites is so important in terms of getting your bees to overwinter properly. Now, even though I talked about varroa mites, it's like, but don't forget, we do have some other things that, that are not as critical as varroa mite, but they're still important. You know, we have Nosema. That's the images there on the right. That's, uh, it's all, Nosema is almost like a dysentery that bees get, and you can see how they've uh, uh, stained the front of that beehive. It's actually a, a, a microsporidium that attacks their gut, and you can see those, those lower uh, right photos are an infected and a healthy gut of, of honeybees. 
And then the other uh, really uh, serious issue we can get sometimes is foul brood. Um, and uh, that, that's where someone's sticking that matchstick in there and they get that ropey slime that comes out. That's the bacteria with the foul brood. These are serious, uh, they're not as common. You know, I, you know, my years beekeeping, I've seen foul brood maybe a dozen times. Uh, no same a, a, a handful of times, but you still need to watch for them and, and take appropriate action if necessary. The next thing about uh, preparing your bees for the winter is getting their winter food reserves. Uh, the bees do not go dormant. Uh, they're gonna warm that colony all through the winter. They may keep the center of that brood uh, close to 90 degrees, even if it's 10 degrees outside. So to do that, they have to eat lots of food during the winter and they move their muscles to generate heat. The colder it is, the tighter they pack in together and they take turns on the outside of that, that cluster. But really the, the fuel that keeps that, that engine going is their honey reserves during the winter. Uh, they estimate that in our area, it takes somewhere between 40 and 60, 60 pounds of honey uh, to get through a winter for a, for a hive. You know, if we have a, a, a mild winter, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, it might be 40 pounds, but a typical winter, uh, maybe 60 pounds. And so I think I have 60 pounds underlined there. I think that's a good target for, for the amount of honey that each of your colonies needs to have to get through the winter. Uh, I also mentioned something about placement. Wherever your bees are, when they search for honey, they only go upwards for honey. If, if they're on top of the honey during the winter, uh, they may starve to death because they won't go downward to get that honey. So you, you want to have the honey around them in, in the center of that, that, that uh, uh, mass of bees or above them. They will go, they readily will go right up to, to get more food. Uh, you may need to do supplemental feeding. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. You can do feeders inside the hive, on top of the hive. I've, I've seen Ziploc bags that, that can be cut and they, they can take uh, sugar water from gallon Ziploc bags. There's, there's dry food. There are even entrance feeders. Uh, you know, it, it, anything is better than not feeding your bees and, and getting them, uh, getting that, that food reserves that they need for the winter. So, uh, and how, how do you measure the amount of honey in your colony? What I do is I walk up to the back of the colony and I, I pull up on the bottom board a little bit and I try and judge the weight of the entire colony there. I know how much a, an empty colony feels. I can, I can at least estimate what the weight of, of the bees and, and the honey in the colony just by lifting up on the back and just lifting up, you know, you know, uh, half an inch or so, you, you can get a good idea how much food the bees have in their colony. But this, this is very important in terms of the winter food reserves. Next thing is downsizing the nest. Uh, different people carry different numbers of boxes through the winter. Uh, some people go with two brood boxes. I've seen some people use a single brood box and that works for them. I tend to go a little bit larger with, with my uh, number of boxes. I go with two deep brood boxes and then a, a shallow super up on top, a shallow or medium super. And that, that shallow or medium super generally is full of honey. And then they have several frames of, of honey in the brood boxes down below. Uh, the one reason why I like downsizing the nest is the bees have to guard this area during the winter. They have things that are going to come in and try and attack the, the honey and the comb. They have, uh, you know, wax moths and they have mice. Uh, they, they have uh, skunks and other things that, that are after them. I have these problems every winter. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'm just blessed with skunks in my area, but, but they attack the bees. Uh, mice move in there. So uh, I, I try and give them an appropriate amount of, of area in the hive that they can protect. And they also need, need to keep that air a little bit warmer too. So, you know, the bigger the space, the, the colder the bees are going to get. 
uh, too small, there's not going to be enough food reserves for the bee. So, uh, and the other thing you need to think about when you're downsizing the nest is ventilation for the winter. That moisture control can be a big problem in bees with a bee uh, colony during the winter. So some people will uh, put a crack between the inner cover and the, and the uh, top box. Uh, I will take a, a drill and I'll drill a small five inch H hole in the upper super. And that helps with moisture management. And it also helps sometimes if you get a heavy snowfall or you get a lot of dead bees that plug the entrance. The bees will need another entrance. I went to look at someone's hive this spring and the bees died and there was a ton of bees in that hive that died. In fact, when I looked at it, there was about four inches of dead bees in the lower brood box. And what had happened is some bees had died with that entrance reducer that plugged up that exit. There was no other exit and they just died because they couldn't get out of the box. That's where an, an extra uh, entrance would help. So. Um, <laughs> an extra exit or uh, uh, some ventilation there. Animal control. Uh, if I do not use an entrance reducer, uh, I will have mice problems. I can't tell you the number of times I've opened up a colony without an entrance reducer and I'll, and I'll see several mice uh, between the frames. You know, they, they, they make a nest uh, in the combs. Um, they're just so destructive. They urinate on the frames. I mean, uh, rodents are really disgusting animals. And so I am a firm believer that before the first frost in the fall, you need to reduce those entrances to keep those rodents out of the colony. You know, when we do get the first uh, fall frost, the bees cluster, they get into a tight ball and there's plenty of room for a, a mouse or mice to come into the nest and make their own nest in a corner of the hive. And they can build up their wall from the bees before the bees have a chance to, uh, to protect them. So get those entrance reducers on. Uh, for us in Lexington, uh, it's usually somewhere between about the uh, 5th of October and the 15th of October when we have our first frost. So I like to have my entrance reducers on by the 1st of October if not before that. Uh, I like guards that keep skunks out. I have big problems with skunks. Uh, they come through the, the winter, they stick their arms in the colony, they grab as many bees as they can, and they eat them. And it, it, it reduces the number of bees, makes the bees very irritable. So uh, I try and uh, put entrance reducers on there that the skunks can't pull out and they can't get their paws through. Uh, I was asking if you guys had any bear problems. I have never kept bees in an area where there are bears, but uh, you know, if you do have bear problems uh, in the fall, they're going to be a problem. In the winter, they're, they're going to go dormant, but uh, in the fall, they can be a problem, busting up colonies and, and stealing uh, honey. Um, I know uh, electric fence is, is a, a pretty good uh, deterrent against that. Well, I haven't had bear problems. When I was in Louisiana, I had problems with uh, Brahma cattle and they would jump fences and flip my colonies over. And I've had problems with uh, uh, wild hogs as well and that they can be a big problem. But yeah, electric fences uh, will, will help with uh, some of these problems. That was a picture. I, I was driving past someone's house in North Carolina and I had to stop on the side of the road and take a picture of his barn because he had, uh, I counted uh, 35 beehives on the roof of his barn. And the only reason why I figured he did that is probably for bear control. The bear couldn't get up on the top of the barn, but uh, that's the extent that some beekeepers will go to, to protect against uh, some animals up there. So uh, I thought that person had a unique solution. He probably had some pretty stout uh, supports in his barn to hold up all that weight too. The other thing I think about during the winter is also uh, how I manage my equipment. You know, during the summer, a lot of the equipment's in use. You know, I'm not gonna do much with it because the bees are using it. 
But when I downsize, I'm bringing in lots of equipment, I'm bringing in lots of supers, I'm combining hives, bringing in brood boxes, lots of frames that are full of uh, comb. Some of it is comb that they've, they've uh, uh, reared brood in. And so I need to uh, store it. I want to store it properly because I don't want to get it, have it get ruined during the winter. And so some of the things I think about uh, is, you know, wax moth control. Any of those combs are going to be subject to attack by wax moths. Mice, just like the mice would attack the, the colonies uh, outside, they'll attack those stored colonies inside. Uh, water, uh, and what I'm talking about is leaks. You don't want uh, the equipment to have water damage. And uh, this is one I added this year because when I was going through my uh, supers in the spring, turns out I had a termite colony that was coming up and I lost about uh, uh, 10 brood boxes and supers to termites this year. So in the future, I'm gonna uh, have practices to keep termites out of them as well. But in terms of storing uh, combs and wax moths, are you storing combs? I think about wax moths. It's been a very serious problem uh, for me over the years. Uh, wax moths prefer uh, combs that, that there's been brood production in the combs, so there's dark combs stored in warm, uh, dark places that are poorly ventilated. This is just a recipe for, for losing all, all that equipment. Uh, wet supers can be attractive. And what I mean by wet supers is after you've extracted the honey, there's still a, a little film of, of uh, honey on them. That's still very attractive to wax moths. Uh, before I store supers, I will have the bees uh, clean up the supers. And what I usually do is I don't like leaving supers outside where the bees start robbing. I'll take the outer cover off and I'll put the supers on top of the inner cover, then close it back up with the outer cover on top uh, for a week or so and just let the bees clean, clean up and dry those supers off before I put them in storage. Um, so, you know, light and ventilation. The, the last slide I showed you was someone a photograph of someone uh, in the northern part of the country where they stack their uh, their supers on end uh, so the light gets in there and so they're properly ventilated. And up there, that's all they need for um, wax moth control. That's not enough for me uh, in central Kentucky. Um, so some of the things you can do if you had a lot of freezer space, you could store your frames in a freezer uh, you can see what the, the cold treatment is. You, you can do it for a short period of time if it gets pretty cold, uh, or you could just keep them in the freezer if you had extra freezer space. Uh, keep in mind when, when I say 20 degrees Fahrenheit for four and a half hours, that's once it gets down to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's the temperature at the center of the mass. So it might actually take two or three days uh, because it has to get down to 20 degrees uh, to begin with. There is heat treatment. I've never done heat treatment. I have done the cold treatment. I've never done the heat treatment because I'm afraid I'm going to melt my combs. But, uh, you know, they do talk about that being a possibility. Just be very careful that you have excellent control of the temperature because a little bit too hot, uh, you're either going to melt your combs or you're going to warp your combs. And if they're warped, they might as well be melted. What I do most often, well, I do, I, I shouldn't say most often, I do it all the time, is I use uh, paradichlorobenzene, and I, I use a fumigant in there with them. I stack my supers up. If there's some little holes and cracks between the supers, I'll put some duct tape to seal those up, and then I'll put a little package with, uh, a, a cloth package with some paradichlorobenzene in there, uh, and I'll uh, seal it from the top and bottom. And that's how I keep my, my supers for the winter. Now in the spring, when I'm getting ready to use them, uh, they have to be aired out. And so I'll air them out for about a week before their use. This is good for empty supers. You don't want to do this if there's honey in there, uh, but it, it, it is very effective. It's approved. You can go to any of the beekeeping supply houses and they should have that paradichlorobenzene available for you. By the way, when, when I was young and foolish, I tried to use mothballs. Mothballs are not approved, and what I found out is they're not effective either. 
So I lost all, all my uh, cones using mothballs. So it's, it's the paradichlorobenzene. So I went through fairly quickly there. Uh, and that's because I found that it's hard to watch a lot of videos and, and Zoom meetings, but I wanted to give you some time for questions and discussion.